Hello, I'm Brett Knowles from PM Squared Consulting. This webinar walks you through an example of building a scorecard in a banking environment. The content is illustrative only and represents the consolidated best practices that we've learned over 30 years and over 3,000 clients. PM Squared is a boutique consulting firm that specializes in performance measurement and management. We've been practicing in this area for over 30 years and have over 3,000 clients from virtually every sector and around the world. Over the last 20 years, every book that Drs. Kaplan and Norton, the founders of the Balance Scorecard, have written cite our clients as best case examples on how to design, develop, deploy, and create value through Balance Scorecards. Many of the other key scorecard and intellectual capital books also cover our approach and our client stories. Over the years, Drs. Kaplan and Norton have awarded our clients four Hall of Fame awards for the different contributions that we've made to the body of knowledge around balanced scorecards. We've learned that the best scorecards are built as simple and as quickly as possible. In fact, typically we build scorecards over five simple phases. First, we capture the existing organization's strategy and strategic priorities. We then identify key performance indicators associated with each of those strategic objectives. From there, we help translate strategy into action by identifying the key processes and sorting out how each process supports the strategic objectives and how well they're performing. This allows leadership to begin seeing the performance opportunities and identifying the effectiveness of existing projects and budgets at closing those performance gaps. On the fourth phase, we then focus on what are the management practices that are needed by the leadership team to take advantage of this new information, and then finally, turning it on. The case study I'm going to share with you is around the Bank of America. Now, it's important to note that I'm not sharing with you any proprietary Bank of America information. This entire case is built on what you could read from reviewing their annual report. As inside the annual report, they're clear about strategic objectives, priorities, performance targets, and so forth. So let's step through how we would build a scorecard for this situation. Phase one is building the strategic linkages. Now, a strategy map is trying to capture what we now know as best practices on measuring performance in the new knowledge creating era. Traditionally, organizations only measure their financial performance hence the accounting architecture we have in organizations. But we've learned over time that we also need to take a look at what your customers or stakeholders want from the business and how well you're performing, how well your internal processes are performing, and then finally what we initially called learning and growth based on Peter Senge's work around organizational learning and organizational growth. To simplify things, we now call them enablers. But over time, we began to realize there's a cause and effect relationship between these things. In the private sector, your goal is to achieve financial success. To achieve that success, you need to make your customers happy. To make your customers happy, you need the right internal processes. And to build and maintain those processes, we need the right enablers, the right competencies, culture, and enabling structures. So we should be able to draw any organization's strategy map across these four perspectives to explain what success looks like. So in the case of Bank of America, we should be able to identify what its overall vision is. In this case, build a financial services company that helps people and organizations create, build, preserve, and grow wealth. Then if we take a look at their strategy, which again, in this case, is documented in their annual report, they describe things like improve returns. Well, that's obviously a financial measure. So we'll put that in the financial perspective. It describes how we need to broaden our revenue mix. For customers, we want our customers to be able to say that we have solved their financial challenges. Internally, we need to learn how to cross-sell our products and also how to bundle them together. Then finally, it describes our need for continually innovating our processes and developing our skill base. So these are the essence of Bank of America's strategy, what we call strategic objectives. Now, to build a strategy map, we not only need to identify the objectives, but describe how they support each other in creating success. 
So in order to improve returns, there's two things we need to do. One is broaden our revenue mix, and two is solve financial challenges. And if we do those two things, our hypothesis is we'll get improved returns. Now, the good news is if we financial, uh, solve our customers' financial challenges, we're also going to be broadening our revenue mix. So how do we solve those challenges? Well, we need to be able to cross-sell our products, and if we can cross-sell them, obviously that will help us solve them. And of course, if we can cross-sell them, that will also help us broaden the revenue mix. So how do we get there? We need to learn how to bundle our solutions. If we bundle our solutions better, that will put us in position to be able to cross-sell them and, of course, help solve our clients' financial challenges. And then underpinning that are the objectives of process innovation and build a skill base. Now, we use one of these big arrows to represent that because building a skill base is intended to support bundling solutions, also cross-selling products, also solving challenges, and so forth. So these are enablers that support the entire strategy. So this is a strategy map, and it's complete, except we now need to communicate the relative importance to our coworkers. These objectives obviously are not all important uh, to the same level. If they were, then nothing would be important. In fact, the game of strategy is about changing priorities over time. So in this example, I've suggested the priority might be something along the lines of 30% focus on cross-sell products, the most important objective. Second most is bundle. Third is a tie between process innovation and financial challenges. Now, this is a strong focus on bundling existing products and cross-selling them. If we're successful at it, next year I would speculate these weightings will reduce so we can spend more focus on helping our customers achieve those benefits and solving their challenges and more importantly helping recognize the revenue benefits for this strategy. So these are the strategic objectives, the cause and effect relationship and the weightings, what we call a strategy map. Now we need to understand how strategy cascades in the organization. So we should be able to take that overall strategy map and understand how it cascades down to different departments or different lines of business or different regions, however you drill down in investigating performance. So in this example, you can see that within operations, we've got a call center, a risk area, marketing, adjudication, and they each have a different strategy map. Now, there's a relationship. So, for example, I should be able to identify the strategic objectives at the top of the house. In this example, solve financial challenges. Now I need to understand how do they cascade down. So in this example, maybe the call center has to learn how to match customers based on the products and services they have to operators who are certified in those products. Risk, on the other hand, needs to understand what are the new and emerging risks that are being occurred as we cross-sell these different products. Marketing, maybe they need to understand what the right customers are for each of these bundles. In adjudication, maybe they've got to you know, establish policies around the bundles. So there's a relationship between the corporate strategy and the drill down. In fact, that relationship typically fits into three categories, mandatory, contributory, and discretionary. Mandatory is each business cascade needs to have the same objectives. Contributory is, in fact, what we see here. We have the corporate objective of solve financial challenges, and each business unit needs to tell the leadership team how do they contribute to that objective. And discretionary are objectives that appear at a level that don't necessarily need to appear further down. Our model is once a department gets their strategy map put together, they should take it up to the senior team to seek approval. And the senior team should be approving the objectives and the priorities. And it's the job of the area manager to then translate that into the processes, projects, budgets, targets, resources that we give them to deliver them in. So that's a bit of a governance framework in how you do the cascade. It's important to note that you don't necessarily need to start at the top. As a department or region manager, you are already accountable for executing strategy. The dilemma is right now that's invisible. It's only through your experience and your gut that you can figure out and guess what you should be doing. This should merely make that intuition tangible and more available. We've learned that once departments begin building this out, the scorecards naturally radiate across your business unit.
So let's move on to the second phase. Once you've identified the strategy, you can then begin to figure out what are the indicators of success. Now I'm emphasizing the word indicator as opposed to measure. At the strategic level, where you're looking for performance across multiple business units, product, regions, and aggregating across multiple chunks of time, typically the best you can do are find indicators. Indicators about whether the organization is performing as expected. I'll give you an example. Uh, one organization we supported has chosen to use absenteeism as an indicator of employee satisfaction. Their annual employee survey seems to validate that if employees are unhappy, they tend to book off sick more. What's interesting about that indicator of absenteeism is the organization gets that data for free every single day because that's part of what the governance process is around human capital. But if I use that data in the context of absenteeism, I begin to learn new information. So in many cases, you have the indicators already available to you. We merely need to understand which indicator has the strongest signal strength in your case. So in the case of Bank of America, if I take a look at their annual report, we can begin to see things like their ability to mass customize their products are going to be measured by things like order to delivery date. They talk about how long it takes to come up with a new product idea until when they're able to deliver it. Personalized service, as we know, has to do with the skill level of the employees in the organization. So how often someone gets transferred in a branch or at the call center is indicative of the skill base and the personalized service we're able to deliver. Fulfillment ratios give us things like the right product, cash to cash cycles give us cash cycles and so forth. So this data is available in the organization already. We don't need to add additional steps. Then we can translate that data into simple performance icons. So in this example, green means we're achieving target, yellow means we're slightly behind target, and red means we're significantly behind target. And the little arrows indicate the trend. So this is green and getting better, green and getting worse, and so forth. Now what's important about this scorecard is we're not telling leadership what's actually getting measured. And the reason for that is that's not leadership's job. And secondly, it'll divert them from the core, their core job, which is to manage at that aggregate or strategic level. So let's pretend this is our scorecard and this is our first performance meeting. Which strategic objective should we focus our attention on to begin with? In this case, it may be mass customization, not accelerate cash cycles. Accelerate cash cycles is certainly red, and that might be our first inclination. But the focus maybe should be here, because I suspect a yellow at 30% is more important to us, a red at 10. Also, because of this arrow, it's very likely that this mistake and error at mass customization is what's contributing to this performance gap at accelerate cash cycles. So this allows leadership to have their strategic conversation. In fact, we suggest in advance of the meeting, senior leadership should take a look at the performance, the weightings, trends, and set the agenda to proportion time in the meeting appropriately. Let's not spend 40% of the meeting talking about this red and find that we don't have enough time to talk about this yellow. Or in other cases, it may be the greens which are more important to us and we should be focusing our attention on. So that's strategic management which are, is enabled by having a balanced scorecard. So now we've captured the strategy, priorities, and key performance indicators at the objective level. We now need to translate that strategy into action. Some of our initial research on the scorecard disclosed that over 80% of strategies seemed to fail, and they failed not because they weren't clever in the perception of executives, but because they weren't executed. In other words, the broken part of most strategy is not the strategy itself, but how we go about executing it. So we should be able to do that translation, take a look at the actions inside the organization, the processes and projects in which we work in, and understand how well they're supporting those objectives and where we might be able to focus our resources more effectively to get the performance gains we're looking for. So 
Here's what we do. We should list those strategic objectives down the left side of a spreadsheet and across the top are core processes. And in theory, we should understand how each core process supports each strategic objective. A simple example there would be, say, a kid going to school. You may decide that, uh, I don't know, math is important to your child and the process of homework is an important process to support getting a good math score. So there's a relationship between our processes and our objectives. So let's take a look at one. Let's say client services is the process we're looking at and personalized service is the objective with a weighting of 10%. So we're first going to take a look at the impact. So on a scale of one to five, what is the impact of that process on that strategic objective? So you could think of a five as being if this process completely failed, what is the likelihood that we could actually achieve this objective? So obviously client services is important to personalized service, so we'll score it as a five. Now, just for fun, we could take a look at how well we're performing. Now, in the fullness of time, we may actually put a performance indicator there. For now, we could just scale that from one to five. Again, one being poor, five being meeting or exceeding expectations. So again, we give ourselves a five. So chances are in this case, we're performing well. So if we put that back into the overall matrix, we'll see something like this. Some processes are performing well, some are performing slightly bad and some have significant issues. Now it's important to note that the scoring framework we have tells us an awful lot about the performance of the organization, but we look at it in light of the strategy. So for example here under operations control it has an impact of five on the strategic objective personalized service. We're performing at a level of four out of five and that mathematically gives us a yellow. Yet down here we have the same score an impact of five and a performance level of four yet this is red. Why is that? Because this strategic objective is twice as important 30 percent versus 15. What does that mean? It means that a process that supports an important strategic objective has to perform at a higher level. So this technique allows us to prioritize the performance levels we need across our processes to make sure that they're performing at the right level according to the strategy. Now obviously if we change the strategic weighting over time what that would mean is processes that were performing at an acceptable level under today's strategy may be performing at an unacceptable level in tomorrow's strategy. Or we could use this for scenario planning because a scenario is basically looking at alternative weightings over here and this allows us to model which processes are going to fail under which scenario. Now that's a bunch of mathematics. We can make it a bit easier to understand by effectively adding up across the strategic objectives to see how much process support we need. So in this example, the length of the bar represents the total amount of process support needed across all those processes to meet this objective. The blue part represents how well we're currently performing and the gold is a gap between current performance and what the strategy is called for. In other words, the size of the gold bar represents the size of the strategic performance gap that exists in the current processes. So obviously, if you had a dollar to spend on process improvement and your choice was between a project to support market understanding with this small gap or accelerate cash cycles with this big gap, obviously you'd get a better return on your investment on this gap here. So it allows us to begin to prioritize projects not based on the rank of the individual in charge or how emotionally interesting or politically correct a project is, but the impact it has on strategy. Likewise, we could add by process and see which process has the biggest performance gap and therefore which process should be invested in. Using the same technique, we can take a look at the other class of actions that people do the projects they work in and do the same thing. List the projects across the top. In this case, we're going to get a return on investment. So what are the resources consumed, be those dollars or headcount? And what are their impacts across each of those strategic objectives? 
In fact, if we scored that up horizontally like we did before, we'll chart those as red dots. So in this example, you can see across the portfolio of projects, there's a lot of projects supporting mass customization and not many projects supporting market understanding. Now remember, these projects are out there to close those performance gaps that we saw. Those performance gaps, again, are those gold bars. So let's just take a look at those gold bars. Where are the gaps? And we'll combine those two charts. This is inevitably what we see. In some cases, we have significant process performance gaps and not much investment in projects. In other cases, no performance gap, yet a significant project investment. This is the misalignment we see between budgets and what the strategy calls for. There are a lot of reasons why this occurs, one of which is you don't have this tool currently to see these gaps. But also, we often launch projects, achieve the benefits, but don't close down the project once we've got to the point of diminishing returns. In other cases, we don't see the gap and therefore don't allocate the money. So this allows us to form a level playing field and make sure that the projects and processes are optimized against the current scenario and strategy. So how do we bring this into a management tool? Let's take a look at an objective, let's say mass customization. If we were not performing well on the strategic objective, we should be able to drill into it by looking at how we're performing against client services, operations control, process management, risk management, and trade support. We don't need measures around monitoring and reporting or trade processing. So we can begin to sort out what is the logical drill down behind each of these strategic objectives. In fact, an extension of that is if we know who the owner is of each of these cells, the overall reporter for mass customization, if there is a performance issue, we can begin to know who it is we should be inviting into that meeting. So rule clarity or accountability aligned up with this matrix allows us to better understand who's accountable and who can work towards solving these operational problems. In terms of building this into an information system, what if we had that strategic objective and we could click on it to drill into what are the processes and projects required to achieve that success? As a reminder, these were the processes we saw on the previous slide. And then we could drill into each one of those to begin to understand what is the root cause of the performance we're seeing. Again, we're not getting the details of what's getting measured, but this dashboard allows management to inquire on what is causing the performance and to begin understanding where it is they can seek performance improvements. So that describes basically the scorecard work through phase one and two. A linkage to processes and projects. Think of that as sort of the lean or Six Sigma part. Now we need to talk about how it is we're actually going to manage with this new tool. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but the important thing is we can manage differently. So I'm going to describe sort of three streams of management that need to go on. And my guess is you have these first two, and this third one is a new one. So here's the thing. Daily or weekly, you're still going to have your ongoing daily, weekly performance review. In that session, you spend about 80% of your time reviewing the performance and 20% talking about and taking corrective action. And we see those meetings to continue, but of course linked to the strategic objectives. Once a month, we should get together and have a conversation about the overall operational performance. And this is also a meeting that probably happens. In this case, we'll be using the strategy map and spending about 40% of our time describing and discussing performance, another 40% discussing the implications, and a small amount of time you know, taking corrective actions. And this process repeats every month as it currently does. The new process we're describing may be this. We're going to take the strategy map, and we're going to take the existing performance. And in that meeting, we're going to work on the business, not in the business. We're going to stop our day jobs and have a conversation to discover whether we actually have the right strategy. Do we need to refine our strategy by changing the objectives, changing the weighting, discuss the implications of the change, and spend a bit of time reviewing performance. But you can see the amount of time you spend reviewing performance decreases, and the amount of time we free up for talking strategy and implications increases.
Now, during that meeting, we might agree to change the strategy map. So now for the next quarter, we're going to run it with a new strategy map, review the performance, repeat the strategic conversation, and maybe change it again, and so forth. So what's happening here is this organization has four learning cycles in the same time its competitors have only one. Or if problems were to happen in the middle of any period, we have a methodology for which we can get together, understand the impacts, and make strategic decisions. This is how we build agility in the organizations and have strategic management that allows us to execute inside of a week or two. So I've given you a bit of a summary. By way of executive summary, we've talked about capturing the existing strategy through a strategy map, identifying performance indicators, preferably that already exist in the organization. From there, translating strategy into action by understanding what are the core processes and projects and how well they support the current strategy and where the performance gaps are to ensure that we have alignment of resources. We then briefly touched on the management practices that allow this new information to enable better business decisions. And of course, the last step is we have to turn it on. What we've learned is organizations can improve their scorecards significantly better by testing it out than by thinking about it inside of boardrooms. So the trick here is to build it quickly, release it to the organization, and allow yourself the time to continuously improve this. I hope this has been interesting to you. It provides an overview of how we can build effective strategic management tools in this case, the banking environment. Please join us at pm2consulting.com for additional webinars on other topics related.